Good morning, uh, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, my heartfelt thanks to the European Central Bank uh, for having us here. It is a great opportunity to um, also explain uh, some of the politics uh, behind uh, this initiative. And I will also address uh, three uh, issues. Uh, what are the EU priorities for ESTER? What are the priorities for Euribor? And what are the accompanying measures that the public sector, in terms of encouragement, in terms of authorizations, and in terms of legislation, uh, what the public sector can provide in this area? So, as opposed to the uh, previous speakers, I will talk a bit about the politics of the process and what's happening uh, uh, around the process in order to ensure the smooth uh, transition. Because what we are really here for, and why the European Commission is a member of the RFR Working Group, or an observer rather, is that we are absolutely convinced that the transition from a existing benchmark, which is a critical benchmark, and which has been designated as a critical benchmark by the European Commission, to a fallback rate or to a risk-free rate is as smooth as possible. That is our absolute priority, and that is why we are an observer in this group. And I think it's important that the European Commission doesn't just legislate and makes proposals, and then these are dispatched by Parliament and Council, and then it's out there, and then we wash our hands in innocence because we've done our job. That's not how we work. If we legislate, and if there are issues subsequent to this legislation, we are involved, as the initiator of legislation, to accompany this process and to make sure that any consequence that arises from this legislation in practical implementation is sorted out. We accompany this as an initiator of policy and also as an initiator of follow-on legislative action, which may prove necessary in order to remedy some of the effects. And this is why the European Commission is a member of this, uh, sorry, I always say member, we're actually only an observer. Uh, so we are an observer of this working group. Seamless tr transition can be achieved in many ways. I think our priority is that the ESTER risk-free replacement rate is published as soon as possible to facilitate the maximum take-up in the derivatives market. But we're also aware that a take-up in a derivatives market implies complex technological operations. You just don't put a rate out there and tell all the counterparties, please, from henceforth, use that rate. There are adaptations to be made, adaptations on the counterparty side, adaptations on the clearing side. So we are entirely cognizant that there might be an adaptation period which is necessary. And that adaptation period requires accompanying measures that the Aeonia does not disappear overnight. The Aeonia is not the future, we want to say that very clearly. ESTA is the future rate, but there must be a smooth transition which possibly entails that these two rates coexist for a reasonable period of time until contracts move on to ESTER. And we have several ways of ensuring this transition, one of them legislative, but there are also non-legislative means, i.e. there might be scope for transitional approvals for benchmarks which are not there forever, but which might be required for an interim period. There's a lot of arsenals in the existing benchmark regulation which allow you to have transitional approvals, to have interim approvals, and we might have to also trigger those if legislative measures either do not fully solve the problem or may not come to fruition due to time constraints in the legislative calendar. And I will speak to that at the end. So this is our main policy for ESTA. There must be the smoothest possible transition. ESTA is ultimately the future rate, but there must be accompanying measures to ensure the transition. And we should keep a maximum of opportunities, a maximum of alternatives in our toolkit. We should not just bet on one way of ensuring this transition. There must be several ways and several alternative ways of ensuring this transition. Coming to Euribor, we are of course cognizant that Euribor is a huge issue, not just for the financial markets, but also for retail, consumer credit, mortgages. This is really about the citizens. This is the citizens need to have safety, to have certainty that this rate will prevail. 
and we have encouraging developments that a hybrid Euribor could possibly be the subject matter of an authorization request and possibly, keeping our fingers crossed, be the subject matter of an approval and all of this within the deadlines of the benchmark regulation, hence prior to the 1st of January 2020. That's our preferred option, no doubt about it, I want to be very clear, an approved Euribor prior to 2020, prior to the 1st of January 2020, is absolutely our preferred option. Everything else is second best. So we do hope that there are good prospects for this approval and we will do everything possible from our side to accompany such an approval process because of the crucial importance that Euribor has for the retail sector, for the mortgage sector, and there needs to be continuity and we don't want the benchmark regulation to be the trigger of discontinuity in this essential rate. Don't try to read the slides. I'm not fully following the slides, so <laughs> don't get distracted by the slides. Those were just for the, um, for the record, uh, for, the, for the book, for afterwards. Uh, so check against delivery. Um. <laughs> now, legislation. Uh, sorry, one more word about Euribor. We do think that a rate which is not based on MMSR data, of course, is crucially dependent on contributor banks. So we are doing everything possible to convince contributor banks that they maintain this essential rate. And I do think that we should have a fallback to Euribor. And I do think that the work on developing a term rate on the basis of ESTA should be fostered. But the best is still that Euribor and the panel banks continue to supply this. And that's the great difference between LIBOR in the United Kingdom. The FCA might be more relaxed about the survival of LIBOR because LIBOR doesn't play that role in the mortgage market. So the European Union must be more concerned about the survival of Euribor than maybe the UK authorities are about the survival of LIBOR, simply because there is this huge retail exposure. So we are cognizant of our duty vis-a-vis -vis our citizens that we are more engaged in trying to save Euribor than maybe our counterparts are in trying to save uh, LIBOR. That's a, also, I think, a very clear message. And then finally to the legislative program. As I said, to ensure the smooth transition, especially in the Eonia to Esther scenario, if we get Euribor approved, there wouldn't be a transitional issue. There is, of course, also the legislative uh, agenda. We have asked for a transitional period extension, which means that in an additional two-year period, not just legacy contracts can refer to the Aonia rate, but also new contracts, if it is not possible to immediately switch to ESTA, could, for a transitional period, still use the Aonia until that switch is complete. We know that there is an issue of mixed incentives here, absolutely. As, longer, as long as you still have Aonia as a fallback, you may not be as quick to transfer your contracts to ESTA. But if Aonia is a fixed spread, it shouldn't make a big difference and it shouldn't be a great disincentive to switch. But we will watch carefully that we will not create with legislative interventions a disincentive to slow down an otherwise rather swift uh, shift to ESTA. We have proposed this due to operational issues. If Aonia gets an approval or a transitional approval to be published as a tracker rate, we would be very happy. It's a fallback. Legislation is a fallback. If there's any way to give a transitional approval to Aonia as a fallback while we are transitioning to ESTA, that's a really good option. We would not be against it. We have, however, because we have a safety net, a duty to also introduce in legislation. So we have introduced this extra transitional period for non-authorized Aonia in the so-called ESA review. And as the ESA review has a lot of other elements and a lot of other debate, we have now chosen a second vehicle, which is the low carbon benchmarks. Maybe some of you have heard that we have made a proposal on low carbon benchmarks. In itself, that's not very controversial. And we have also introduced the amendment in the Council into the proposal on the low carbon benchmarks. Likewise, the European Parliament has also introduced the amendments on the transitional period into the low carbon benchmark proposal. So we have two parallel le legal vehicles out there which have this transitional period as part of their amendments. Will any of those two make it through the legislative process between now and when the Parliament breaks for elections? That's the great unknown. 
That even the European Commission can't guarantee. Which one will be the better one? We don't know. That's why we chose both. Safety net approach yet again, dual track. We see a lot of dual tracks here. Uh, yet again, we have the dual track. Hopefully one of them will make it and the issue is resolved. But if none of them makes it because simply the legislative calendar doesn't permit, we are actively engaged in the fallback solutions on how to keep a parallel track between ESTA and a reformed Aeonia in this transition. It must be time limited, but maybe there are many, many other possibilities which creative people can think about to maintain a parallel Aeonia until we have full certainty that operationally the ESTA switch is possible. So this is what the working group is thinking about. There's a lot of work going on. It looks much better to conclude. It looks much better at the moment than it looked when we started this working group. I think that's fair to say. When we started this working group, the Brits had already done their thing, the Americans were doing their thing, and we were sitting there saying, oh my God, maybe we have to actually also do something. And we were very late off the starting blocks here. And I think we've gained a lot of time because a lot of people are super engaged about this and a lot of people really take this seriously. So we've made up for lost time. We've been able to learn from some of the other examples that we have out there. We are rapidly catching up. We're rapidly closing the gap. And possibly we will be in a very good position on the 1st of January 2020, either through accompanying measures, creativity, or possibly legislation. But I would like to thank, on behalf of the European Commission, all the participants in the various working groups, in the risk-free groups, for their unusually high level of engagement, for their, we are talking about financial services, for their legislative creativity. Are you very creative when it comes to issuing new financial products, and we can hardly follow what you're doing. But you've also shown a significant amount of legislative creativity. We have already three versions of the term extension in the European Parliament. Everything a bit of a nuance different. Hopefully in the trilogue we'll get them together and agree on one of those three or a compromise between those three. You have been very creative. We appreciate that a lot. That's democracy. And I think possibly by the 1st of January 2020 we will be in a much better place. Thank you very much.